first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I actually uh, really um, enjoy being here. I usually like very much uh, teaching master courses because you can go a bit more in depth uh, into things and uh, discuss things uh, in a bit uh, well more academic uh, sense. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, really interested in, in hearing uh, also your concerns, uh, your questions, and so on after the presentation. As for the presentation, I was thinking e either I would present a standard paper and uh, talk a bit more and introduce you into the theories and the background and, and then kind of follow the usual steps, introduction, background, state of the art, and then uh, design findings, conclusions. And uh, I will do that, but before, um, I thought it could be interesting for you to learn more about the background. So, because I remember when I was uh, a student, I had to read all the papers and I had to listen to the presentations, but um, it was kind of, I, I was detached from how this research was produced. So I was not really aware where the data came from, how, how, how it was produced, how a story was derived from the research which was conducted. So I thought I'd take the opportunity and provide you with a little bit more info on the research project uh, I'm working in and then can tell you the story how we produced the paper out of that uh, research project. Um, so uh, this is uh, why I put here uh, Beyond Capacity, Conditionality and Compliance. This is the title of the paper. It's a paper I'm also going to present tomorrow on a, on a workshop. Uh, here, um, but I put uh, research on the youth employment initiative in context. So let's start uh, with the context. Um, the context is a so-called research unit uh, on horizontal Europeanization. Uh, it's uh, seven universities in Germany and Austria, among them Humboldt University in Berlin, which is a very lovely place. If you want to go to Berlin, visit the university. It's a very ancient, lovely building. Um, and uh, we gathered a lot of money from the German uh, Research Foundation to study six years, three plus three, uh, horizontal uh, Europeanization. So uh, there is kind of the argument that um, European uh, integration is not only creating a common market and so on, uh, but that there is also something going on in the society. So we have kind of a transnational social integration and we have also different perceptions. So it's, uh, the European society is becoming more transnational. Something is happening to our everyday lives and so on. And um, seven dimensions of these social processes are studied in the research group. It's a very sociological focus. Maybe you have heard of, your, uh, of political science, Europeanization studies but this is a sociological study and it's in, in this sense it's somehow cutting edge because it's also theoretically advancing the field. Um, it has a joint overall theoretical framework, social fields uh, and social space. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu, I'm, uh, uh, I think uh, you are all uh, familiar with him, neo-institutionalism and we will see how this comes back in in a minute. Uh, I hope you can uh, read that. This is just a brief overview on this research project. Um, the different uh, people and universities involved are listed here. Uh, and we can see that it's really different dimensions of what we call this horizontal Europeanization. So um, maybe let's see whether this, this works. Uh, here, the uh, colleagues at the Free University in Berlin, another university in Berlin, uh, they are studying whether there is something emerging like a European solidarity, so a solidarity among uh, people in Europe, not only with their own uh, country, on, but also with other countries and across countries. Uh, then everyday practice, they study, it's very interesting how uh, the European integration process influences traveling, phone calls, marriages, friendships, and so on. Um, 
Here they uh, study social stratification. Is there a transnational social stratification? Can we, for instance, observe a European middle class, a European working class, and so on? Um, and then we have a few fields. These are in, in, in dark yellow, which are more concerned with the policy fields or something, yeah. Um, it's not that cross-cutting, but more specific how research is framed uh, by uh, the European integration process, how asylum uh, administration, um, labor relations, and finally our project, um, EU professionalism. Um, this is, uh, it's, it's one of the sub-projects, um, and it's interested in, as I put it here, emergence and consolidation of new areas of employment and activity as linked to the process of European integration. I'm pretty sure you all uh, already came across an EU professional because these people are working everywhere. I believe every university now has an EU office dealing with EU uh, affairs. Um, we have a lot of consultancies dealing with um, EU issues. We have a lot of EU contact points and so on and so on. So um, there, the EU expertise, this is the basic uh, argument, has been institutionalized and very professionalized uh, in the last decades. Um, the theoretical background of the subproject is sociology of knowledge and new institutionalism. And in the first three years, um, the project studied how these EU professionalists developed uh, so, and the professional activities um, became standardized, so a new profession emerged. And now in the second phase, um, we are studying what is going on in this field, in this emerging field. So how the EU professionals negotiate European and local stocks of knowledge and we are particularly focusing on European funding. And uh, this is why I was hired for this second phase of the project, because I wrote my PhD thesis on the European Social Fund in, in labor market policies uh, in six European countries. And uh, we cover the European Social Fund uh, to some extent in, in this project. But uh, we also cover research funding so um, it's kind of a comparison. We wanted to see how similarities and differences are between different fields. Um, but we, and we focus on the youth employment initiative and you will see a little bit more on that in a minute. So what we did in the project um, in the phase one where I was not uh, contributing at that time, uh, the colleagues conducted in-depth biographical interviews with EU professionals, so they wanted to know who they are, uh, which uh, pathways they went, what is their uh, professional background and so on. They analyzed job newsletters, websites and so on. And they kind of documented this emerging space of EU professionalism. And then in the second phase we're doing expert interviews with beneficiaries of EU funding, so those who receive the money um, but also those who administer the funding or deal with it in, in a certain way. So particularly the consultancies I mentioned and the EU offices and so on. And we're also doing uh, document analysis. And um, I'm not going into detail uh, with this, but this is just to show you that the, the project, the sub-project, the overall project and also the sub-project has already some more or less specified guiding research questions. So we were interested in the program praxis, um, uh, practice aspect. I'm sorry, this is just a copy paste uh, mistake from German. It should be practice. Uh, in the translation processes, in problems, ambivalences, conflicts, in uh, the ongoing process of, of EU funding and in conditions for success. So this is something from the proposal which we uh, handed in to the uh, research foundation and we got the money for. But this is not something which is um, very specified. So if uh, I give these research questions to you and say, okay, give me an answer, 
you could invent many different ways of answering these questions and you would tell me, yeah, okay, but what exactly do you want or how should I do it and wh what is the, the specific aspect we are interested in? If you should write your uh, master thesis on uh, such a question, it would still be very uh, broad and hard to process. Um, so in this uh, research uh, project, we are kind of confronted with very relatively broad research questions, but still pretty defined, but broad. And we access the fields, in our uh, case, the uh, expert uh, interviews, with these um, broad research questions in mind, and we develop interview guidelines. This is a, just an example for uh, those, um, if I remember right, it's for those who actually work with the money on the ground level, so the implementers of a program in the Youth Employment Initiative. And you can see um, that we have some questions. We don't ask these questions in the exact wording. It's just to help us through the interview. And if we have a good, okay, yeah, now I'm, I'm lost and I have to uh, get back, then I can read a uh, question loud, but it's more a guideline. But um, we have also, and unfortunately it's still in German, but it doesn't matter. What I wanted to show is that we link these questions directly to the broader research interests, which make it then, uh, makes it then in, in the uh, end a little bit easier to organize the data, but still doesn't answer our research questions. It's a way of organizing it. So what we did, um, so we have kind of around about 100 interviews now, which is 60 interviews from phase one and more than 40 from phase two and a lot of documents and so on. So this is a huge database. We are three people uh, working on the project and uh, not all of us full time. So it's way too much to really go through it in a very detailed and in-depth manner. But um, we have, as I said, we have a broad research interest and we are going to write um, uh, overview publication, the emerging field of EU professionalism. So we will do some broad and overall coding and analysis for it. So it's kind of mapping of the field, not digging deeper into it, but kind of structuring the field. And then we do some very selective analysis for smaller studies. And this is something we cannot really know in advance. When, when study, starting such a qualitative uh, project, it's not that I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm going to write a publication for this or that journal with this or that topic very specifically, but rather I conduct the interviews, I speak to people, I read the transcripts, and then I say, well, okay, this is a very interesting point. And I identify a puzzle and a, in something which is interesting for me, and I'm going to show you in a second how we did it with the uh, paper. Um, and this is also what we did with a few kind of uh, selective dimensions of these um, um, EU professionalism field. So we have, for instance, an article which deals with projectification. So turning um, research, but also uh, labor market policies and so on in, in forms of projects limited time stuff, uh, fixed uh, objectives and so on. This is to some extent something which has been introduced by European funding, not in all cases, but we, we found it uh, very interesting. So we wrote an article on that, kind of uh, digging more into the literature on, on projectification. And then uh, a colleague wrote an article on biographical pathways of EU professionalism, totally different uh, strand of literature, of course. So always kind of picking out a, f a little aspect and then uh, linking it to the literature. We had a very, uh, I say, funny paper on the power of nomination. Uh, it's again, Bourdieu coming in here, uh, of the EU in research policies because um, my, I did my PhD uh, uh, in, a, in a 
EU uh, project, FP7, uh, EU funded, and um, I entered, the project was called Local Social Cohesion, I don't know, remember, but I entered the project and said, okay, so local worlds of social cohesion, so what is this social cohesion? By that time it was not that relevant. W w what the hell is social cohesion? Please <coughs> tell me. And then after, uh, then I learned what social cohesion was and I used the term and uh, then we started to use the term active inclusion and uh, resilience and so on and so on and then I realized, okay, this, these are terms framed by the European Union. So they, they make calls and they put in uh, terms and then they give the money for it and we're going to use it. And this is a small article where we kind of joke a little bit around with that. But it's, uh, it's still nice, but as you can see, a totally different aspect. But we have a lot of it in our interviews uh, with, the, with the colleagues and the uh, EU offices and universities saying that it's all about dropping the right words, the right terms in the, in the proposal. So we kind of dig more into that. And finally, um, we have several other articles uh, around, but mostly in German and not that uh, explicit. Uh, finally, I'm turning uh, towards the implementation of the Youth uh, Employment Initiative. Um, because uh, we had, um, in the second project phase, we had kind of different interview waves. And one was about the implementation of the Youth Employment Initiative. So not, it, it was really on the ground with people working um, with the unemployed youth or uh, at least organizing the courses on the ground in the municipalities. Um, it was, it's a very small sample, so it's, it's nothing representative. It's, it's more of uh, getting a first um, insight into it with our specific research perspective. And we did uh, 13 interviews in Spain and in a municipality in, in Andalusia. Um, I'm not uh, telling the city because it's a case issue of anonymity. Uh, and we, we did so far seven interviews in Poland. We're going to conduct a few more, but it's, it's really a limited sample. But still, in I have the impression that I don't need to talk to uh, any more people because everyone was telling the same. That was also very interesting. So there was no divergence, almost no divergence between, uh, we had two cities in each country, between the, the, the cities in the country or between the countries. It was everyone telling the same and everyone having the same stories again and again. So um, this is how I started to generate my puzzle. I'm, I'm going to present in a moment. Um, in the interviews, we focused, uh, as I presented the four broader research uh, questions of the subproject, we focused particularly on two of them, the program practice aspect and the ambivalence of conflicts. So try to dig a bit more into that and asking very carefully, so uh, how, do you, um, how do you implement it, uh, telling, okay, I was working in a European project as well and we had some problems with the bureaucracy and how did, do you feel about that and being kind of very sensible um, to dig deeper into the conflict thing. And then um, we have all the, uh, the data collected and then uh, my boss says, okay, now on, come on, write a publication, we have to disseminate our findings. Uh, and then a colleague calls and says, yeah, okay, well, do you want to contribute to a special issue uh, here? Your <laughs> colleague said, uh, uh, do you have something on the youth uh, un uh, employment initiative? And then we say, okay, yes, yeah, we have. We're coming just back from Spain and very interesting. But it's still a way uh, to go. Um, we have to read the transcripts and postscripts. We have to do some very rough coding to organize the data. And then we have to kind of reflect what was interesting, what was puzzling, just a very brief uh, reflection. I'm, I was sitting there with my colleague uh, discussing it and then kind of w thinking what kind of story we could develop. And then I think the most interesting and the most challenging part comes in because then you have to link it to a debate. So have to uh, situated in a literature, st literature strand and uh, 
see how it fits uh, with the debate. So the puzzle comes both from the data and from your knowledge uh, of the uh, literature. Um, and then we develop a structure to tell the story um, because it's not that we tell the story in the same way we develop it. Because in, in, in as you will see in a paper, the puzzle comes uh, after uh, a discussion of the literature. And this was not the case uh, when uh, identifying the puzzle here. So kind of in, in qualitative research, I always tell my students, it's, we have a standard way of presenting our research and uh, writing a paper, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you also do all those steps, in, particularly in qualitative research, uh, in the same uh, way. And this is, uh, of course, different in, in most uh, quantitative studies. Um, well, and then we go to, uh, towards drafting the paper, uh, doing a more fine-grade coding analysis, refine the arguments, and then really write up the paper, which is hard work. Um, now, very briefly, because I'm not going to bore you with the too many uh, theoretical arguments, I just wanted to uh, locate uh, the, the things uh, into the broader settings and now just show you what we did with it. Um, our puzzle and our story. So wh what we observed when coming back from the interviews is that we saw a mismatch between the local needs and the European policies. And we expected to find a lot of implementation problems, but there were none. They weren't complaining. It was all going very smoothly. It was, they, they were real experts doing a good job in implementing it. But still, it was not really doing a good thing to the local situation. Um, so, uh, I really love this quote. I'm going to read it. Uh, it's from a Spanish interview. And he said, we always said that we have the best trained unemployed people in Europe. Why? Because they have been to vocational schools, because they have been to municipal training orientations. They have been to provincial orientation services, federal orientation services. They have gone through trainings organized by the chambers of commerce by the confederations of entrepreneurs, by the association of whatever, by the provincial governments. The problem is that when reading the CV of these people, you say, this person did a secretarial course of good. Afterwards, he did a course in electronics and later in forestry work and later he's been to a vocational school for plumbing. So, uh, this person he's talking about has obviously uh, enjoyed a lot of training and many of these training uh, supported by the European Union in different uh, forms, but that doesn't produce jobs, of course. So only because we train him for a plumber, there is no job for a plumber. So uh, this is, could, so this we identified and we could make a story out of it of a mismatch of supply and demand. Or we could say, well, European Union is not uh, really doing a good job because only supply side uh, policies um, are supported. But this is not what we could ta tell on the basis of our data because, as I said, we were more interested in the conflicts and ambivalences and the processes. So it's not really that we could tell the EU is not doing a good job because it's proposing the, the wrong uh, measures. So what we did, we kind of constructing a different puzzle uh, and telling a different story. Um, and this story is then written up uh, in a paper. And what we were doing is referring to a classic uh, political science literature on uh, EU funding implementation, what I call here the classical uh, narratives. And then uh, we are challenging this literature with a fresh pers perspective, what we call it. And then we link our uh, findings to that. Um, and we, of course, start uh, uh, the paper with a framing how severe it is. And I'm not going to tell you uh, about youth unemployment because uh, I think you know much better than I do. Um, and we also locate the youth unemployment in the context of EU funding, of course, as you do in a good paper. You uh, present your object of research. 
Um, and I'm not going to tell you about this because I uh, want to uh, skip to the findings uh, uh, briefly. But then comes in what we present as the theoretical puzzle. And this is what I said, the classic narratives of uh, implementing EU structural funds. Because, um, as I said, I've written my PhD thesis on it and I've um, worked a lot with, these, uh, with this literature. And we can find particularly three C's, as I call it. Compliance is a big thing. So they always say, okay, with the funding, there comes some eight, uh, some, some, some comp things you have to comply with. So legal conformity uh, with the processes uh, of, of the funding has to be done. So if you want to get money, just follow our rules. So this is uh, w what the compliance literature says. And then different uh, actors at the local level comply differently. And then we have administrative capacities saying uh, if uh, a local or a national bureaucracy doesn't have the uh, respective capacities, then uh, they might not be able to use uh, the funds in an efficient way. So again, very um, settled literature. And again, we have the conditionality aspect saying um, it's not only that you have to comply with formal rules, but it's also that some programmatic conditionalities are tied to the money. If you want to uh, use the money, you have to spend it on very uh, particular um, aspects. So, um, and these, uh, that's uh, why I put here CCC is supposed to explain misimplementation, non-compliance, adverse outcomes. So this is the literature talking, okay, there is money, but why, does, why uh, something else is happening on the ground if the EU has all these uh, measures. But, but as I said, we did not observe this. Administrative capacity was not an issue. And as I will uh, tell you, it was not, we did actually not find what was in the literature. And that was, of course, interesting. And then we did deeper into neo-institutional uh, debates um, and uh, particularly discourse on decoupling, which is already pretty old. Um, some of you might uh, have heard of it. And, and the basic argument is that um, in uh, large organizations, we uh, can very often find uh, decoupling between formal policies and daily practices. So uh, very simple, people are not doing what they are told to do because they have different perceptions of a good outcome and they just don't want to do it, but they, they think differently. So this is kind of what many scholars since the, I think, 1970s have observed in organizations. But a new literature saying that in uh, environments where we find a lot of accountability, and this is something you probably grew up with, but for me still it's a bit new, but um, having to prove every little administrative step, filling in files, filling in timesheets, proving uh, every little uh, step you're doing in a project, so accountability, managerial driven, um, they argue it's not, it's not possible to, to detach this. People cannot do what they want because they have to follow the rules. There is no other way. But this doesn't mean uh, that always it's, uh, the, the outcomes look like what they should look or how they are designed by the formal policy. So this is a kind of a literature we uh, um, uh, dig a bit, bit more into. And we argue that indeed the Youth Employment Initiative is a prime example of accountability-driven environment because already the other funds, European Social Fund and so on, uh, are very uh, accountability-driven. You, you will always hear, oh my God, this is uh, something uh, very special. But in the Youth Employment Initiative, it's kind of uh, even stronger. So um, we ask, is there this this original type of decoupling still possible, policy practice, or do we find the other one? Um, and then we argue what our research interest is in the paper and we uh, describe our design, but you already know about the design, Poland and Spain and so on. But we present it uh, in the standard manner. And then 
we present our, uh, our findings in a way that we discuss the three C's uh, stepwise. And uh, we, we show that if we look through the lens of uh, decoupling, we find a different story that, than in the classic narratives. So compliance is um, a pure obedience to the accountability tools. It doesn't mean uh, a compliance uh, with the EU policies or uh, ideas, but it's really obedience to the accountability tools. And the, the two quotes um, are illustrating that uh, the um, that one saying, we are not allowed to deviate. And uh, then we ask, yeah, but uh, maybe uh, there are some aspects which you don't really support and you try to bypass them in some ways. None of us would work here if we did not support the procedures. So it's really something uh, of their own self-perception, this compliance. Um, same story with administrative capacity. It's not, um, it's, it's not something which is questionable. It, we can't ask, do they have the administrative capacity or not? No, they all have it. They are experts. Uh, it's, it's really uh, incredible. Um, they say, this is our job. A lot of tables, compilation, constant contact, constant supervision. This is the specificity of our job. So it's, it's neither a new insight nor a problem. It's just the character of this job. They are experts. Um, uh, and they, they complain about the administrative workload, but it's simply accepted. So this is really challenges also the administrative capacity literature, I would say. And again, the eight conditions, uh, whether uh, actors support the, the, the eight conditions behind the funding, this is something which is also not, um, it, they criticize the youth employment initiative in some regards, but not as part of their job, just from a personal perspective. And I really love this quote, uh, s um, an interview saying, if you go to a Japanese restaurant, there are restrictions. You can only eat Japanese food, you can't eat Turkish dishes. But within the Japanese menu, there are a lot of possibilities to eat different things. So this is the same. The program works as it works. So no room for just uh, using the money for what you might think is better. It's just you do what you, what you do. Um, and then saying, if your friend invites you to the Japanese restaurant, you don't say that you want to go to McDonald's. So the EU is the friend inviting uh, them to the Japanese restaurant, and they are not going to say, but I think young people would benefit more from this or that measure. No, no question, because it's simply not possible. So um, to summarize, uh, we challenge the three Cs. Uh, so we, we say it's different narratives, and what we find, and mostly because, and this is the, the lens we are uh, looking through, because you can see a lot of other uh, stories out there, but the story we tell is about the, the decoupling thing, um, that here there is no decoupling po possible uh, because uh, of the accountability uh, measures and the very strict procedures, but here this is kind of decoupled, the, the local needs are not really addressed. So, and then uh, we come to a, a conclusion um, and uh, argue that uh, this is something new for the youth employment initiative literature, it's something new for the uh, decoupling literature. We challenge the traditional narratives in the Europeanization literature, but of course our study is very limited we have a very small sample. This is qualitative insight. We need more uh, research uh, to generate, well, the generali generalization. Um, but still, we think that uh, our findings point towards um, a need for studying these uh, accountability uh, aspects in EU funding. So this is how we uh, kind of selected a little piece uh, out of the out of the project uh, to, to write a paper out of it. And it, we, we selected it just because we liked 
uh, the, the first quote I mentioned. Um, and we were not able to tell a story of uh, true or false policies, but we uh, had a different story to tell on the basis of our data. So this is just an encouragement to observe the world, observe the data you have, and uh, kind of pick out your puzzle and then tell a story. Thank you.